This project is a cooperative production of the Ken Heckler Documentary Project, LLC, and Marshall University, being presented with financial assistance from the West Virginia Humanities Council, a state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Your great movement has many heroes. The greatest heroes are you, the coal miners. You've taken the future, your future, in your hands, and you proclaim no longer are we going to live and work and die like animals. We're free men! Mark me down as one of Ken Heckler's big fans. This is someone that understands that uh, government has to step in sometime and stop the bullies from picking on the little guy. Presented the Harry S. Truman Award for Public Service in 2002, Ken Heckler spent a lifetime establishing a formidable reputation through his efforts on behalf of ordinary people. His passionate pursuit of justice sprang from his experience as a political science professor and combat historian, as a researcher for Presidents Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman, and as a U.S. Congressman and West Virginia Secretary of State. The philosophies, decisions, and events shaping Ken Heckler's life offer a detailed study in character and the merits and challenges of politics and public service. To me, it takes a very special kind of a talent to be the type of a servant that Dr. Heckler has been. To do anything else in the way of an occupation other than working with people, I just don't think you'd be successful. Ken Heckler was always this person who really didn't say that much, but his, his, his presence made you feel comfortable to uh, engage him and to trust him. He looks at you and kind of looks at any and then he nods a little and listens to you. You have the feeling every word you say he's digesting and that he's going to think about that. Ken had this great zest for public service. I mean, there was an enthusiasm that he brought to public life that I think was a distinguishing characteristic. I think politics and public service, and I put those two together, are the lifeblood of Ken Heckler. He loves the challenge. It invigorates him. It energizes him. Ken always reminded me of a windmill. I mean, he was everywhere. I mean, he was in the front row, the back row always buttonholing somebody and always talking about something for West Virginia or his constituents. I've been in politics all my life and I've never seen anything like it. Lincoln said that government should do for people what people cannot individually or collectively do for themselves. As a student of history and as a public servant, Ken Heckler came to understand that people make government work, that government must be accessible to the people, that government must serve the people, and that government without justice leads the people to ruin. What's justice? Just a sense of fair play. That there's a level playing field. That all people, regardless of their station in life, regardless of their class, regardless of how much money they have, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of how they look, everybody's treated equally. That's justice. The mark of a good politician is to provide justice. I'm going to fight for a labor reform bill which will help clean up racketeering. Well, that's one of the things that's the hallmark of Ken Heckler. Well, whatever you may disagree with him, I don't think you could ever question his motive that he tries to do what he thinks is in fact just. The preamble to the Constitution of the United States sets certain priorities. The very first priority is establish justice. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, established justice. Established for whom? For we, the people. 
the most important individuals, human beings, not special interests, not corporations, not heads of labor unions, not any other special interests, but we the people. Central to the story of Ken Heckler are individuals in government, in politics, acting on behalf of the people they represent. Politics is a noble profession. To go into politics is to enter one of the most important human endeavors. It's hard work, it's challenging, but it can also be enormously gratifying. If you know what you're doing and you're effective at it, you can make positive things happen that otherwise would not happen. Politics is the authoritative allocation of scarce resources. There is never enough to go around for everything that is good. Someone in authority has to determine what are we going to do. Shall we build a new school room or a new highway? Shall we develop more tourism or shall we help mental health? That's what politics is, pure and simple. So if you really want to do good with a capital G, politics is where it's at. But in the popular sense, politics is thought of as a game of winning elections at whatever cost. I must say, from my experience, it's the politicians that have given politics a bad name by just wanting to hold office and wanting to get reelected rather than using their office as what Theodore Roosevelt described as a bully pulpit. It was very inspiring because he set an example. He always had the underlying principle of justice. Ken Heckler's pursuit of justice is rooted in progressivism. Driven most notably by Theodore Roosevelt, the movement tackled social and economic woes arising during the Industrial Revolution. Progressives were driven by a true sense of social justice for the poor, let's say, or the dispossessed on the one hand, and seeing their self-interest served by rectifying that injustice, and also seeing their self-interest served by a continuation of capitalism. Our aim is to promote prosperity and then to see that prosperity is passed around, that there is a proper division of prosperity. Demanding increased wages and a shorter workday, anthracite coal miners in Pennsylvania went on strike in 1902. The strike provided President Theodore Roosevelt an unprecedented opportunity to put his progressive ideals to work for the nation. Up until this time, any time there was a labor conflict, particularly after the Civil War, the federal government, to the extent that it did intervene, tended to intervene when the strikers were winning in order to beat them and use their authority to help out the business or the corporate side of the equation. Everybody expected, well, this is going to be just one of the same old things. They'll give the coal operators what they want and grind labor under the heels. And Roosevelt surprised everybody by making sure that equity and justice prevailed. Which worked largely to the benefit, at least temporarily, on certain bread and butter issues for the workers at the expense of the operators. Roosevelt saw this partly as a national well-being issue because he was afraid stockpiles of anthracite coal were going to run out as winter approached, and he thought this would undermine the health and well-being of the people and the health and well-being of the economy. A sound recording, made 10 years later, captured the essence of Theodore Roosevelt's commitment to social and industrial justice. As a people, we cannot afford to let any group of citizens or any individual citizen live or labor under conditions which are injurious to the common welfare. Industry, therefore, must submit to such public regulation as will make it a means of life and health, not of death or inefficiency. In 1918, Theodore Roosevelt addressed a crowd near his Long Island home and impressed the Heckler family of Roslyn, New York. 
Instead of sitting up on the stage or walking out from behind the curtain, he started at the back of the audience and walked down the, the aisle, shaking hands with people, grinning in such a way it looked like his teeth were, were moving from side to side. But it was such a dramatic difference from most politicians in the manner in which he showed how excited he was about getting out among the people. Ken's parents, Charles and Catherine Heckler, were staunch Republicans and ardent practitioners of what Theodore Roosevelt described as the strenuous life. 